Hi, I'm Marcus with TheIndieMusicLab.com. So last week we discussed three insights you and I can learn from Novo Amor. And the feedback and the response to that video was great. And so I was like, okay, I'll just keep this train rolling and we'll use a different artist, we'll just plug and play. And today what I thought I would do is take that same format and this time we're gonna look at Phoebe Bridgers. And we're just gonna up that number by one because as I was doing the outline and trying to come up with ideas and things I wanted to talk about and share in this video, I came up with four core things that I think are gonna be incredibly helpful to us producers and creators in our bedroom or home studios. So let's go ahead and let's dive into the four things you and I can learn from Phoebe Bridgers Productions. Now, many of you, if you are a veteran on my channel and you've been watching my videos for a while, you probably have heard this remake. This is my recreation of the song Kyoto by Phoebe Bridgers, and that sounds like this. Day off in Kyoto, I boarded the temple at around at 7 -11. Okay, so that's what we're working with. Now let's dive into the four insights that we can learn from Phoebe Bridgers. So the first thing that came to mind, and the first thing that I think is the most important thing that we discuss here is this idea of follow the feeling. And what I mean by follow the feeling is one example is I want to look at the vocal EQ on this and I want to show you what that looks like because the typical, the standard move when you're working with you know, within indie rock, indie pop, this type of genre is you're probably going to do some boosting on the EQ of a vocal to kind of make it cut through the mix, right? To add some brightness, to just add that nice modern sound to it or whatever it is. I want you to look at the EQ curve or the EQ moves that I made on this vocal. Look at this. Look at what's happening in the high end here. Now I'm going to turn this EQ off. So here's what it sounds like without it. Right, right. Now, listen. Now, some of you watching this are like, I like that first one better. I like it without the EQ. It's brighter. It's more crispy. Then that's fine. If you had made this song, then that would have been the correct move to make. Because why? Because you were following the feeling. I can pretty much guarantee you, although I don't, I haven't talked to Phoebe Bridgers. I don't know her. I haven't talked to her about this, but I can pretty much guarantee that when they were in the studio creating this, they were like, okay, I want a warm sound. I want a blanketed sound, whatever language they used. It seems when you go listen to the original, it's pretty obvious that they were intentional about cutting away the high end and having it sound more warm in nature. And so that's just one example of you don't just blindly follow the traditional way of doing things or what everybody else is doing or what the majority is doing. Instead, you follow the feeling and you follow where the song is taking you. And if you feel like your song should be very warm or should be very bright and airy, you lean into that because that is where you, you are going to find that vibe. That's where you, you are going to find that connection with the listeners when you lean into that rather than trying to, again, just follow the status quo or what everyone else is doing. Now, we've all done this, right? I mean, we've been I know I have where I'm working on a song and I'm like that snare drum, I think, is too loud and why did I think the snare drum was too loud? Not because I didn't think it sounded good. I thought it was too loud because it sounded a little louder than, you know, another song that I thought in my head. I was like, but I don't think snare drums are usually this loud. They're not supposed to be this loud. But and so I would then turn that down or maybe the vocal was too bright or not bright enough or maybe the compression. There was like I thought it sounded good to have really, really harsh and really biting compression on that vocal. But I was like, am I going to get judged by some, you know, God of the music universe that's going to be too much compression? Um, now, there's there's a place for this when you're starting out, right? It's sort of this is you could think of this as that old adage of follow or learn the rules and then you can break them. But you can also take that too far. Uh, because 
I think it's a good idea to start to get into the habit of being willing to break the rules pretty early on in the process. I don't think you need to master the rules before you break them. You want to learn them. It's good to be able to, you know, in this example, recreate a song and actually get it pretty close to the original. But then you also want to in, get into your own world and really follow the feeling and the mood of the song. And there's one quote. Uh, I actually don't have the quote. So this is just a paraphrase. I just remember Phineas once talking about in an interview. I remember one of the things he mentioned was this exact type of thing of like his overall idea was, do you like the way that your song sounds? Because that's what matters. And that's the greatest defense against people who say, oh, that's too much compression on the vocal. Oh, the snare drum's too loud. Why is your kick so weird sounding? You can always defend against that if you like the way it sounds. And that's the important thing. Do you like the way that that whatever element it is, do you, do you like the way it sounds? Because if you like it, then lean into it. Okay. Follow the feeling. Don't follow conventional wisdom if it doesn't actually apply to your specific situation. So that's the first thing. Now, the second thing I want to talk about here, and that is stereo is not always better. I think this is a very important thing to bring up because just like most producers, when they started out, I fell prey to this as well, or this fallacy of everything needs to be stereo. Wider is always better. And that's simply not true. Wider is not always better, especially because, especially when you narrow it down to the individual tracks, width generally comes from combining elements that have narrow lanes. So you could pan something to the left, pan something else to the right. In isolation, they're not wide at all. But when you put them together, it creates width and it creates, you know, an interesting stereo feel that you wouldn't get if you tried to, you know, just widen every track. And I think it was Dave Pensato who uses the term big mono, right? Where if every track in your session is stereo, it's just kind of a big mono. It's not actually really stereo, or at least not in the traditional sense of the word. Um, and one of one example of this is when you're recording and producing vocal doubles. So the traditional method of vocal doubles is you record some extra takes in that double over that lead vocal, you pan it left and right. So, right, so we have the lead vocal. Day off and keep Let me come to the chorus here. I'm gonna kill you. So that's the lead vocal, so then you just bring in some doubles, right? If you don't beat me to it, dream it through Tokyo sky. So we have the two vocal doubles there. If you're listening on headphones, you might already be noticing what's happening here. These doubles are not panned left and right. They are all down the middle. So I'm going to solo the lead vocal in those two doubles. I you to see, see the world. See, here's what it would sound like if we panned them left and right. Girl, then I flew over the ocean. And I in context. Change my mind. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, this kind of goes back to the first insight of follow the feeling. I want you to notice the difference because this is a different sound between this. That's wide. Versus if we bring those doubles to the center. Do you notice the tunnel effect it creates? It's just a different sound. And for this particular song, I think it's a better sound. Stereo is not always better. And this applies not only to vocal doubles, but I would say this especially applies. Really keep this in mind next time you're working with reverbs and delays, because sometimes a mono delay can just sound so perfect, especially in a dense mix where you've got a lot of things happening. You know, you've got guitars on the left, guitars on the right, big wide drums, you know, maybe vocals and, and, and some um, vocal O and background tracks that are spread out across the stereo field. And then if you have that lead vocal delay that is just very narrow or a reverb that is very narrow, or in this case, we have the vocal doubles that are very narrow while the guitars and everything else are out wide. 
it creates just an interesting color that is sometimes better than if you try to make every track stereo or try to always have that goal of stereo or if you have the mindset of wider or stereo is always better. It's a bit more complex than that because it's not always better. Sometimes mono actually sounds better. Now, speaking of vocal doubles, if you want to learn more about what I just did here with these vocal doubles, as well as four other approaches to vocal doubles, then be sure to check out my five ways to record and produce vocal doubles. These are my top five approaches that I've learned and that I use to really create different types of vocal doubled effects. And this applies especially if you're into indies. So we talk about the type of effects that Bonnie Vera uses, the type of effects that Phoebe Bridgers uses here, and other indie artists as well. So I'll leave a link in the description below for that. So go check it out. So that's the second thing. Stereo is not always better. Now, the third thing, the third insight that I want to share with you today and that I want to discuss is this idea of adding one component or one track or one sound that is unexpected, that the genre that you're in. So I would call this like a softer indie rock song. We can just call this indie rock. I think that's fair. Most indie rock songs is what, you know, you've got bass, drums, usually acoustic drums, vocals with maybe some slap delay, maybe some vocal doubles, light reverb, not too much ambience, just kind of keep it nice and grounded and keep that raw quality to the overall sound. And then you've got maybe some acoustic guitar as well. But usually you might have a keyboard, you might have a synth, but it's usually not very much happening there. One of the things that you can do to really set yourself apart and to just make every song interesting is by adding just one thing that is unexpected or that isn't generally thought of as a part of that specific genre. And a great example of that is in this particular song. So notice when the chorus hits, there is that. It's It's just a trumpet sound. You don't hear that in every indie rock song, right? It's a trumpet sound. When have you heard that in indie rock? This is such a great example of using this because here's what it sounds like without the But oh my God, it makes such a difference, right? You lose so much of the life and the vibe that this song had with that trumpet sound. And this uh, leans into what we talked about last week in the Novo Amor, Novo Amor video. And that was this idea of make every track in your set in your session virtually indispensable. This is a great example of that because the difference from when you mute that trumpet to when you turn it on is massive. I'm such a huge fan of that, so go try this out, and this is going to be a game changer for your songs. All right, just one more thing I want to talk about today, and I could not finish this video without talking about an effect, especially on a vocal, and that is slap delay. Slap back delay is for winners, and the reason I bring this up is because this is especially relevant to the genre of indie rock. When you are producing indie rock, slap delay is one of your, it's it's almost like a hammer in your toolbox. It is so effective at creating just enough space to create a nice live feel to it to where it doesn't sound too dry and too, you know, like you're in a studio, but it actually sounds like you're on a stage or in a club and the sound is bouncing off the walls a little bit. That is the effect that a slapback delay has on your vocal specifically, which is what we're going to talk about here. So I want you to listen to... Listen to this mix with the slap delay turned off, and then I'll turn it on. Let me actually come back to where it's just this solo lead vocal. It's fine. But here. See, here's without it. Call me from a payphone. They still got payphone. 
and here's with it. It costs a dollar a minute. A slap delay is such an easy delay to set up, so you can literally use any delay, go with your stock delay, go with the hall delay like I'm using here. It does not matter. It's very easy to create this type of sound. So what we have here is, oh uh, wait, that's not the right one. Uh, slap delay, here we go. And here's what we have. Now you can either make this mono or you can make it stereo. Going back to the second point I made in this video of stereo is not always better. So experiment with slap delays, try mono, try stereo. And if you're trying for stereo, usually the best way to get that is to have a dual style delay where you have a delay left and a delay right, and then you can offset them slightly. So this is based on milliseconds, so we're not or we're not locking into the tempo or the BPM of this song. Instead, we're in milliseconds mode, and the delay left, I have it 67, delay right, I have 89, which means that left delay is, is slapping back at a slightly different time than the right delay, which gives that illusion, which gives that stereo sound that you hear. And now, to tell me you're getting so one of the things when it comes to slapback delay is generally you want your feedback to be at zero or just pretty low in general, because here's what happens. But you wrote me a letter, but I don't have to read it. Now it can actually sound cool if you turn the feedback up a bit to where it has that springing effect, right? Brrr, you know, a little bit of that. I'm going uh, let me turn it up so we can really hear it here. Gonna kill you if you don't beat me to it. Versus if you have the feedback all the way down at zero, that's just one slap back, just one delay hit. So it's bam, 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 and that's it. But if you have the feedback up, it's bam, 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 bam. So it creates more of a springing type of effect, which can 100% sound cool as well. So just experiment with the feedback, although generally you want it to be pretty low, okay? And then obviously everything else, you can experiment with the delay that you have. Now in this case, I put this delay on a return track rather than putting it directly onto the vocal track itself. And then I'm sending, I'm using a send and I'm sending the lead vocal to that slap delay. And then, um, that's basically what's happening, a bit of drive. And then also, I have the EQ cut here on the low and the high. So if you do have your delays on a return track, either use the EQ, whatever you can do inside of the delay plugin, or if your delay plugin doesn't really have that, you can always add an EQ after that delay and you know do some work to create that nice warm sound so that the delay doesn't overrun that lead vocal, so that it's just very complimentary. But anyway, that's just a tip for especially producing indie rock is slap back delay, my friend. It's for winners. Use it all the time. I use it all the time whenever I'm working on this type of song. And it's going to make such a difference to the quality of your tracks. And it's especially helpful when I especially am, am a big fan of using a slap back delay instead of, say, a room reverb or a plate reverb. If you want a an overall sort of dry sound, try a slap delay instead of a reverb. Because I think nine times out of 10, especially for indie rock, it sounds better. So those are my four insights that I think you and I can learn from Phoebe Bridgers. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you wanna dive deeper, like I mentioned before, be sure to check out my top five ways to produce vocal doubles. I will leave a link in the description below for that. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.